So we're thinking about uh, the uh, pictures of the church. And any of you who've missed this so far, uh, we're thinking through the images and the metaphors that the uh, New Testament uses for the church. In our pop-up uh, house group last week, uh, someone said, I didn't know there were so many images and pictures of the church. That was a, there was not a, a youngster or a young Christian. As someone who'd been a Christian, a very mature Christian, she thought, you know, I didn't know there was all this interesting pictures and stuff. And so hopefully as we work through this, we can work out uh, more uh, about what it's all about. So we go to the second slide, please. So they're so busy looking for the remote. They, there, there we go, we got there again. So today we're thinking about the fact that we're a gathering of people. So the Greek word for church is ecclesia. And what ecclesia means, it means a gathering of people. And the word ecclesia is it's not a religious word, it's a, it's a neutral word. It just means a gathering. So when you stand in the queue... Oh, don't you love that word? Those of us who are British, we love that, don't we, standing in a queue? That's an ecclesia. It's, it's a gathering. When you go to the theatre, that's an ecclesia. When, when, when you're here in church, it's an ecclesia. When you stood at the school gates, that's an ecclesia. It's a, it's a gathering of people. It's a neutral word. <clears throat> and it's interesting that the word for church is a word that God has adopted from the world. It just means a group of people who are um, uh, gathered together. And so there's an example of this on the next slide. Can we put this up? Uh, this is from Acts chapter 19. And the words there in bold... Uh, that the NIV translates assembly is the word ecclesia, the words that she used for church. So just a bit of context. Uh, soon the whole city was in an uproar. The people see, seized Gaius and our... Oh, goodness, how do you say that? Our, our Arista... Do you know what they taught us at Bible college? It's a little secret of the theological school. They said, if you're ever sure, not sure how to pronounce something in the Bible, say it and sound confident. Because <laughs> no one else knows either. It's not like we've got recordings from first century people speaking Greek, is it? No one has any idea. So let's go with, let's call him Arty, actually. That'd be good, wouldn't it? Gaius and Arty, Paul's travelling companions from Macedonia. And all of them rushed into the theatre together. Paul wanted to appear before the crowd, but the disciples would not let him. Even some of the officials of the province, friends of Paul, sent him a message begging him not to venture into the theatre. The assembly, the ecclesia, was in confusion. What is this ecclesia? This ecclesia is essentially a group of people who's dragged two people off the streets into a room. This is a mob. So ecclesia can mean like a gang of people who kidnap somebody. <coughs> That's interesting, isn't it? It's not what you immediately think when you think of church, is it? Oh, I suppose it depends who made you come this morning, maybe. I don't know. So anyway, the ecclesia was in confusion. Some were shouting one thing, some another. Most of the people did not even know why they were there. Does that apply to church? Probably not. If there is anything further you want to bring up... Oh, this is a bit further on where someone's trying to settle it all down. He's doing the old calm down kind of thing. If there is anything further you want to bring up, it must be settled in a legal ecclesia. So we've got the mob ecclesia, the legal ecclesia, like the courts. Uh, as it is, we're in danger of being charged with rioting because of what happened today. In that case, we would not be able to account for this commotion since there's no reason for it. After he had said this, he dismissed the ecclesia. So do you see what I mean? The word can just be used in a whole variety of ways. And it's the word that God has chosen to mean church. Church essentially is a gathering of people. Church isn't a building. And I know we call this the church, and we should really try hard not to. This is a building in which the church meets. And it's interesting even that sometimes one of the things churches do, and we do it here, and I'm hoping to beat it out of you spiritually, um, is, and I do mean that spiritually, is we call this bit the sanctuary. And we make this bit more religious than that bit. Uh, and I don't get it. I, I get that we do it, and every, every church, there's loads of churches up and down the country have sanctuaries and the other bits. Uh, apparently, according to Eleanor, the bit in there is a yellow room. I don't know, it must be true, doesn't it? I'd like to call it the kids' church room myself, but, uh, but Eleanor's always right, so it must be fine. And I've got to take that bit off the recording. Uh, so... Um, we, I don't know why we do that. We make everything about the building and we make bits of the building religious. In one of the churches I um, served, they decided that they could rent any part of the building out apart from the sanctuary. I, I don't get it. 
Because this isn't a temple. This is, this is a building that we, the people who are the temple, inhabit. There's, there's nothing special about this room. When we pray in a week, uh, just over a week, as I shared earlier, there's some serious things we've got to pray about. And we're going to use the yellow room. Not, not because it's more religious or less religious, it's just a better space for a prayer meeting. Do you, do you see what I mean? It doesn't matter, does it? When we were in lockdown and we were all in our homes, did we feel like God had abandoned us because we couldn't get to the sanctuary? It's a strange thing, isn't it, how, how we do that, where the New Testament clearly teaches us that we, the people of the church, but we still attribute to a building a special or more religious status. Another church that I served uh, a number of years ago, the most bizarre thing happened, and I can't explain it to you, it's just a fact, it just happened. Whenever we prayed for someone in the church for healing, it didn't or rarely happen. It rarely happened. I prayed for two or three people in the community, one at the school, I think I told you that story before, and they were all instantly healed. I don't read it, I'm not, that's not the rule, any rule of life. I think that was just God reminding us of these people. You know, I'm not sat in here all week waiting for you to come back. This is just a building that we meet. This is a building we inhabit. And, and strange thing, if one day our church got so big we couldn't meet in here, we might go somewhere else. That's not the plan. Don't panic anybody. I realise I've just trod on some toes. But actually, we've just got to realise this is just a building. Yes? If one day we come in and the inspector comes around and he says, do you know your roof's going to fall in and it's going to cost you £5 million? Pounds. OK, I've just exaggerated, maybe. That's probably cheap. You know, we, we have a choice. Do we maintain the building or do we move somewhere else? There's no plan to move anywhere else, but it becomes a legitimate question because we realise that we are the church, not, not the building. We have choices about where God is leading us and where he wants us to go. Anyway, back to Ecclesia. The Greek word ecclesia is used roughly 114 times in the New Testament. And so can we go to the next slide, please? So here's an example. Here's 1 Thessalonians 1, uh, verse 1. To the church uh, of the Thessalonians, in God the Father, the Lord Jesus Christ, grace and peace to you. So the church in Thessalonica, ecclesia, to the gathering in Thessalonica. And it's interesting, most of us know the famous uh, verse about church. Jesus said, I will build my church. When he said, I will build my church, he says, I will build my ecclesia. I will build my gathering. Isn't that lovely? Building my gathering of people. And of course, the ultimate gathering is going to be at the end of time, earthly time that is, as we stand before Jesus in that huge gathering, in that huge crowd, as we stand before him. And we remind him, ourselves that we are one people, that Bethesda Baptist Church is not the ecclesia of God. We're part of it. We're, we here are not the church, are we? We're a church congregation, of which, of which there are many churches, but there's one church, one church. So we go to the next slide, please? So the church is a gathering of people. So just a couple of things that will come up there one at a time. First of all, uh, people are more important than projects. People are more important than projects. And I think this is really important because most churches I've engaged with appear to think projects are more important than people. One of the things that was interesting to me in my previous job uh, as I worked with churches across a whole region, I was responsible for developing the, uh, the grants, how we gave grants to the churches in the region. And one of the things that we did on our application, we shifted the emphasis from what sort of things do you do to tell us some stories about the people you've engaged with. And one of the things that we found really interesting in the results and what came back to us, there were some churches, some flagship churches that were running amazing shiny projects and they couldn't tell us any stories about people. So busy doing stuff, they didn't have time to talk to people. Just let it sink in. When we run a project or an event or a thing, it's about people. When we think about how we are as church and how we organise ourselves, it's about people. And so that's why we have something like a pop-up house group. We're not going to do them for all time. It's just creating space by which people can meet. And we talked about that last week. That the things that we would do anyway, we can invite other people to join us with. Uh, second thing, there's different size gatherings. So in Acts chapter 2, it says at the end of Acts 2, verse 46, every day they continue to meet together. 
in the temple courts. They broke bread in their homes and ate together with glad and sincere hearts. So the early church met all together, big gathering in the temple courts. And I showed you a picture of the temple last week, didn't I? That huge space that thousands of them will be packing into to hear what was going on. But they also met in their homes. They recognised that for the good of their faith, there were things that they would get from being in a crowd, a huge crowd, listening, and the things they would get from being with a few other people in their home uh, eating together. The third thing, uh, to be in a gathering, you have to be present. It's interesting that the word that is used for church is about, it's about the people who are there. It's not an abstract word. It's not a theoretical word. It's not, it's not about saying if you're in or you're out. It's about where, where you're there. Now, it's also worth noting that the word ecclesia doesn't, and I think I said this last week, it doesn't apply just to a Sunday morning. It's about any time we gather. So it can be a Sunday morning, it can be a house group. Do you know, it could be, as we think about the questions about this series, you might say, do you know, I couldn't get to a Sunday morning or a house group because of my shift pattern at work, but I'm, gonna, I'm just going to ring two or three other people and we might chat, or we might do a Zoom, or we might chat over WhatsApp. Do, do, do you know what I mean? It's about, it's about saying, how, how do we gather? Because cause this here, Bethesda Baptist Church, is not the guilt church. I'm never going to say to any of you, where were you on Sunday morning? I will say to you, we missed you. So we're missing Matt this morning. Matt's not here, he's on a course. Are you all right? Are you just relieved? Okay, you'll cut that bit from the corner there. Matt's away on a course. We miss, because Matt isn't here, we are different. So we miss Matt, but no one's going to go and find Matt next week and say, where, did, where were you last Sunday? How dare you go on a course and not be amongst the Lord's people? That's not what we do, is it? He, he was on a course. Now, Matt has missed out by not being here. I'm not, I'm not, I don't mean that in any kind of arrogant, big-headed way, because if, we, if we're gathering around Jesus, then anyone who's not here is missing out. But we recognise that in this modern, crazy life that we live, there are courses on a Sunday. People work on a Sunday. Sometimes you have to go to the hospital on a Sunday, don't you, for an appointment. It's crazy, isn't it? Life is different, and we've got to learn to roll with that as a church. But we also need to recognise the value of a gathering. So to be in a gathering, you have to be present. And one of the questions we need to ask ourselves in our busy lives is how do we prioritise gathering? That if we can't be on a Sunday, how do we prioritise a different type of gathering? Uh, next one, please. Uh, crowds are usually diverse, and you can see that. Just look around the church now. We're not incredibly diverse here. You've got youngsters like me, uh, and uh, people who aren't so young. And uh, but we're not uh, we're not incredibly racially diverse. It's interesting, isn't it, when you think of uh, Trowbridge uh, and actually the diversity that does exist in Trowbridge. And it's a question we ought to ask ourselves: Is there anything about us that is present preventing? that diversity that you would see in Trowbridge, and I don't just mean the colour of someone's skin, I mean different nationalities and so forth, I wonder why that's not evidently present amongst us. Now, there may be absolutely no reason, but it's an interesting question, isn't it? Crowds are usually diverse, and finally on this screen, uh, you can't be in a gathering by yourself. And discipleship is relational. And this is where it bottoms out, this is, this is where it comes to. If you'd have got the Graham Ross 27 years ago out of Bible college, I was three years old, maybe I was a bit older than that, I was in my early 20s, and um, if you'd have got me, I would have been very much preaching it to you, saying, you have to be in church on Sunday. That is, I'm putting my spin on what the Bible says, because that's just, you should, you must be there, and it would have been very heavy-handed. And now I want to say to you, Oh, this is just whistling at me here. Is there anything we can do about that? You're on the case, are you? Now I want to say to you, if you're not here, you're missing out. But I understand that you can't always be here for the reasons we talked about a moment ago. But actually, there are times when some of us could be here, but we choose not to be. And now that's not for me to judge, but I'm saying this to you as a biblical challenge. If the Bible says we should be gathering, be that here in a house group, amongst friends, how do we build one another up? How do we learn to prioritise and think about that? How do we move, if it's true, uh, away from that popular uh, belief across Great Britain that church is something I choose to go to? How, how do we shift back to this biblical principle of the church's the, the gathering? And it's good for me to be there. We build one another up. 
So moving on to the next question, uh, what are we gathered around? I love this picture that I came across. Oh, can you just go back to that last one? Love this picture that I came across uh, a number of years ago. Again, this is something I'm going to try and pronounce to you. This is something called Holocenes, uh, and it was from Toronto's uh, art festival, which I think is pronounced, and I'm sure someone can do me uh, a good one. In fact, I know someone here who could really help me out with this, but I'm not going to put you on the spot. Scotia Bank Nuit Blanche. 2014. Anybody can help me out with that? And I'm deliberately not looking at you. Uh, but uh, no, that's okay. Uh, and, uh, and it's just this art festival. And each year they do a different thing. And um, at this one, what they decided to do, who comes up with these things or who knows? They had these giant tanks around the city centre. And in them, people performed ordinary tasks while the tank was filled with water. And then the water drained out and then the water went in. And it was all about climate change. And it's saying, actually, because of climate change, OK, we won't all live in tanks one day, but actually, you know, we live in this world where, where our climate is being affected. And when I saw this picture, and I was looking for a picture of a crowd gathered around something, I thought it's just such a wonderful representation of the church. Because what is going on here? The people are gathered in the darkness around the light. And we gather around Jesus, don't we? And more so as this person in the tank is struggling trying to do something because all the water's in the way. I thought, what a brilliant picture of life. Don't you feel like that sometimes? I'm trying to live my life and it feels like I'm being flooded out. It's all gone wrong. But in this chaos, the light is shining. Can you go to the next slide, please? So just uh, a number of pictures. Who or what are we gathered around? So we just talked about being gathered around Jesus. The second thing, I can't remember which order they're in, so you're going to have to help me. Go on, tap that. Thank you very much. Uh, what <laughs> church is gathered around? Now, this is the drill sergeant church. I'm sure you've all been to these churches. This is the church, the stressing church, I like to call them. The church where everyone gets in line with the pastor's agenda. You know, the minister has a vision and you are going to make it happen. The stressing church. And what some churches are gathered around is that busy stressiness. What some churches are gathered around, this third thing, uh, is the idea that you have to be the same before you can come in here. You have to be respectable. You have to be like one of us. And if you can do that, then you're welcome. The fourth thing uh, on here, for some people, it's like a broken church. And you look at this poor boat, and it's just like nowhere near the water. It's broken. It's derelict. And some churches feel like that, and I've visited churches... And you speak to people and it's like, oh, we've just got no hope. It's all gone wrong. And in contrast, you get other churches like this next one, the Victorious Church. And you see it on their website. Come to us and be healed. Come to us and you'll be happy and rich. Come to us and live victoriously in Jesus. And this is going to be a strange one, but sometimes you get churches who are so... Um, based around the Bible, it's going to sound very odd, but it's important to say, they're so fixated on the Bible, they've forgotten about Jesus. Now that sounds a really weird thing to say, isn't it? Because we only know about Jesus as revealed in the Bible. The Bible is the word of God, but primarily, we don't gather around the Bible, we gather around Jesus. And when we read bits of the Bible and we don't understand them, and we're trying to make sense of it, we come back to Jesus. Jesus is our Lord. Jesus is the one we follow. Should we go to the next slide, please? Can I just realise what time it is? Uh, the fruit of the Spirit. The more we gather around Jesus, the more these fruit will be evident amongst us. A wonderful story for you. So in my previous church, um, we did a values exercise. And uh, one of the things um, uh, that happens when you do a values exercise. It's, it's a values exercise isn't a leadership saying to the church, these are our values. A values exercise is where we listen to one another and define our values. And one of the things that astonished me when, when we defined our values at the end of the exercise based on what everyone had said was one of our key values was for people of peace. And it really made me laugh out loud because if you'd have come to that church, it was just chaos. It was, and you might think it's chaos here. This is very civilised here compared to that church. It was just awful. And the main problem with that church is we didn't have an Eleanor. We just, did, we just didn't have an Eleanor. So there was, it was just disorganised. It was all over the place. 
And usually things, we, people would turn up and it would be like it was communion and no one had thought, it. oh no, what are we going to do? And when we talked about it some more, I said to the church, and I was saying, I was really surprised that you were saying that we're a people of peace. And they said, yes. Because in amongst the chaos, in amongst the chaos, there's always calm. Interesting. And I'd not seen that, and that's what people were reflecting back to me. How are these things seen in us as we gather, as we become the people of God? How do we see these things in action amongst us? Are they evident? Because if they are, they're proof that we are becoming the church that Jesus is calling us to be. So next uh, slide, please. We're coming towards the end. Why do we gather? We thought about the importance of the Bible. I'm not belittling the Bible. I'm just saying Jesus first, then the Bible. But obviously we read the Bible to read about Jesus. It's still echoing at me. It's driving me bonkers. Is there anything you can do? Do I need to go back to that one? No? I'm going to need to go nearer to it, do I? Okay. There we go. How's that? That's even more echoing now. Okay. okay. I'm going to try back to this one. Right, we'll try that. That's <laughs> echoing. Do you know, you wonder how Jesus wondered, managed with all this PA and stuff, don't you? Can you that? <laughs> Simon Peter, can you turn me down a bit? You know, that sort of thing. So uh, where do we get to? Why do we gather? So let's go to the third thing on the screen then. Why do we gather? Uh, we gather to talk to God, but we gather to talk to God together. And there's actually something powerful. As much as many of us find prayer meetings awkward, we talked about that earlier, there is something powerful um, about when Christians pray together. So if you can come and pray with us a week on Wednesday, we'd really appreciate that. Uh, next one, we meet together to do that. We meet together to listen to God. Together, in fact, just bring them all up, please. We meet to listen to God. We meet to build one another up. We meet to plan for life and what is ahead of us. We meet to consider uh, what it is that God is leading us into. We think, how can we spiritually plan and prepare ourselves for everything that we'll be facing in life together. Uh, and the next slide, please. Uh, what sort of gathering then are we? Uh, why do we gather around? And so we are a gathering, hopefully, that builds people up, that prays, that centres around Jesus. Fourthly, uh, we're a people who are together, we bond together, we hold together, we stay together. Fifthly, uh, everyone is welcome. Uh, the thing I'd say about this, and again, I'm back to the chaotic church that I'm not going to name, I mean, it really was just all over the place. It's much better now because their minister is really organised, their new minister. And um, I had someone come to our church. One of my minister college friends was on a uh, holiday, he was on sabbatical, and he came to my church. And he said to me um, afterwards, he said, you know, Graham, he said, when I came to your church, it was the best welcome I received. And I laughed out loud, it was hilarious. Because when he came to my church, there was no one on the door. So you see what I mean? There was no one on the door to welcome anyone. And there was something else went wrong, where he didn't, oh, he didn't get a bit of paper he needed for the service. It was one of those sorts of things, it was just like, oh no. But he said, do you know what? He said, that was true. No one shot my hand when I came in. But it was by far the best welcome, because people spoke to me. And just think about that for a minute. It's really important that we have an organised welcome. I'm not belittling that. But then there's a genuine welcome. When people sit in here after a service, when we're having our tea and coffee in there, and people are like, it's really nice to see you. When people are moving away from their friends and people who they could be clicky with, and are spending time with someone who is new to the group, that's the genuine welcome, isn't it? That's the biblical welcome. And the final thing uh, on the slide here, is the old kintsugi image that I love so much. And in the kintsugi, you take what is broken and you repair it, but you make it more beautiful at the same time. And it really struck me, will, will we be a uh, church of healing, of holding together? When things go wrong, when we fall out sometimes, when we see things differently, will we be a church, will we be a people? We uh, draw together, where we come together and we say we love one another and we want to hold together above all else. Will we be a church where, where we do fall out, that we think actually we need to talk about this and sort it out. We don't just want to grumble in the background. We want to be a church that loves each other enough to realise 
that peace isn't the absence of conflict. Peace isn't hiding from things. Peace is facing up to stuff and talking about it and working through. And just finally, on the last slide here, there's some questions. Again, if you can just pop them all up, please. Uh, I'll circulate these round. Uh, and these are the questions we're going to be reflecting on in our small groups uh, this week. And I'll just leave them up quietly for you to look at for a minute. 